As you go higher, your finger positions, like the relationships between your fingers get closer together. So playing in third position is not just moving your hand and then doing exactly the same thing as you do in first position. So your students need to practice both of those skills and I recommend that they practice them separately before you try and put them together like in pieces that have, you know, a section in first position and a section in third position. Um, do you want to tune? The shifting book. So level one, this is not something that you're going to have to like talk about or write about for your exam or your written work, but I think it's useful for you to have it kind of in mind and to understand how we teach it because it's likely that you're going to have some students who are not just level one. Um, good, so if you think about in terms of the first three books or the first four books, book one is like learn to play the violin, right? <laughs> book two is learn how to shift for me. Book three is learn how to vibrate. And book four is then everything comes together and you have shifting and vibrato and, uh, you know, concertos. Um, and of course, that's not all that you're doing, but that is a kind of overview for me of the first four books. Um, so in terms of uh, introducing shifting for the very first time, we want to just, I think, go between first and third position and make sure that they understand that this act of going from here to here involves having a heavy finger going across the top of the string and then dropping when you get there. And so for my students, we do a lot of what I call ghosties, which is this, that we want to hear that ghosty bit in the middle. Uh, what else do they need to think about when they're doing that exercise? Soft thumb. Yeah. Good, soft thumb. Keep the thumb circles and yeah. Yeah, good. Some soft thumb not gripping. What else does the thumb do, Mimi? Um, well it, it must travel as the whole hand travels as one unit. Exactly right. So make sure that the thumb is staying in the same relationship to the one as it was when you were in first position. And we uh, it's really, really good to do this in group lesson. If you've got a book two group, this is a great exercise to do with them. They can do it in pairs, they can watch each other, you can do it with them, you know, one one in front of each of them, it depends how many students you've got. Um, but the little story that I tell is like, okay, do you have a pet? Joe, do you have a pet? Yes. What is your pet? It's a cat. It's a cat. Would you like to take your cat to the beach if you were allowed to? Yes. Yeah. And what's your cat called? Susie. Susie. Right. So this is Susie. 
and this is you, and these are your, you know, toys or siblings or parents or whatever. Here we go, we're going on the train to the beach. Take Susie with you. And then when they do this, which often lots of them will. Oh my goodness, you've left Susie at home. Come on, Susie, she's gonna be crying because she knows you're at the beach having a great time without her. Right, and if you do this, you see this? Well, can Susie go on the train by herself? I don't think so, she's a cat. Right, or a dog or whatever. Yeah, <coughs> so it's a really great kind of um, story to use for them because they really understand that you've got to take her with you, but she's not going to sit on your knee on the train. Like, she can sit next to you in her basket. Bring her with you. Yeah, and they can, like, make up what their pets are. And some of them have, like, pet elephants. And, you know, you can kind of go a bit mad with it, but um, it's really fun for them. Mine is a luggage on holiday. Luggage on holiday, yeah. yeah you take don't forget your luggage. You luggage and don't leave it behind. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh, yeah. And so then you can do that on each string. What are we going to check for, uh, Freya, when we're on the G string? <coughs> um, I feel like making sure their elbow is kind of like round. And yeah, exactly. Make sure that they've got a mobile left yeah. elbow, yeah. yeah. And that if you, yeah, <coughs> if you can bring it forward, then when you come back to the E string, that no, they haven't got this happening. Yet. So you can do this kind of exercise is a good one. Yeah, let's just all do that. So you're strumming the strings, it doesn't really matter which finger. And then of course, if you've got students who are not well set up here, that will really show. And then you know that you need to kind of call a halt on that and sort out how they're holding the violin, whether their head position is good. Um, okay, so let's do some ghosties. We'll do four on each string. Uh, going from E down to G, and from first position to third position, so my turn. Top note with the open string below. So 
Check it so it's in tune. Um, but probably in book two, lots of them will still have a three tape. I, um, as a reminder for tape plans, for me personally, uh, for my beginners, they have a uh, red finger pattern, one, two, three, and sometimes a dot for four. I rarely have a full stripe for four as well because I think it's visually confusing for the top one not to be the three. Um, but sometimes they'll have a spot or a little bit of line. Uh, and then when they get to G major, we take the two tape off because they know that their two is either going to be next to one or next to three. So we've just got one and three, maybe a dot for four. And then as they go through book two, I would take the one off, particularly by, by uh, Mignon. Some of them it's useful for Mignon to have a one tape so that they know they're going behind it. Um, but you certainly want to be talking about them getting ready to take it off. And so by the end of book two, I've taken all of the tapes off except the three. And very occasionally they might still have a four tape. And then the three stays on all the way through book three, even though they don't need it anymore for shifting specifically so they can see where third position is. And then when we introduce second position, then they can see that that's where the two is going to go. Mm. Uh, and then by book four, some of them still have a three tape, but really I would I prefer it if they don't have any tapes left by book four. Certainly by the Vivaldi concerto, I think if you're playing proper concertos, you shouldn't really have any big tapes down. <laughs> um, the other things I find with the finger tapes that, I mean, I, I think they're valuable, but um, I, I sometimes have a problem with the kids because it, it turns it into a visual thing, doesn't it? And they, they start trying to look like they, they move the, the position of their head because they're looking at their fingers. So, but you, you but don't, you think, <laughs> don't you think the position of their head is exactly looking towards their fingers? No, I know, but sometimes, like, but sometimes they, they start, yeah. they start looking. Like, you know, right. I've, I've had a few. I've had that much that. more with yeah. looking at the bow. Right. Because yeah. it's so close, it's uncomfortable to look yeah. at. And so when I start to talk about looking at the bow, mm -hmm. they're like, mm -hmm. that, that to, often yeah. happens to me. Yeah. You get to do a couple of repetitions with your eyes closed. Oh, I do. Mm -hmm. I do that. I will do that. I'm just saying that I think that's the problem with the finger tape side. Yeah. Is that it, it turns it into a visual thing rather than a normal thing. But I, I agree that they're, they're, but I think, I mean, they're very helpful. Yeah. I wouldn't teach without them, little ones. Yeah. Caroline, do you use finger tapes? Yep. How would you, if you had a parent who, let's say, played violin and never used them, and they said, I don't want them to have finger tapes, why, why do you, why, why would you use them? How would you respond? It's a good guide. It's, you know, to... Because every child learns differently, mm -hmm. like visually, you see the pattern. So, you know, it's so important to realise the pattern of where the things are going and visualise that. Excellent. And then you're working together with the audio skills as well, you know, building that up. Very good. You will lose the pattern, you know, the pattern of the pressure, but then it's always in the brain. Yeah. It? Perfect answer. Well done. So, the first point is that you see the pattern, and that's the pattern you're trying to recreate. Uh, who have I not picked on yet? But what would the can you explain a little bit more about how the oral and the visual work together? They can hear mm -hmm. us in the right place so that they've got sort of two mechanisms to go on. So they're not just relying on the ear, they've got the eye as well to say that you're in the right place. Exactly. So then that trains the ear to know, oh, yes, this is in the right place because they've got another. Mark. Exactly, <coughs> exactly, well done. If you make sure that your fingers are always going to be in tune, I mean, not perfectly perhaps, but you know, at least within a uh, margin of error in tune then you're training your ear correctly every time whereas if you have no finger tapes and you can imagine the child might be playing in tune 30 percent of the time because 70 percent of the time they're going to be thinking about something else then it's going to take a lot longer to learn how to play in tune if you ever do manage it and also if you if you say, okay, well, fine, but I'm going to just teach them how to play in tune, then you're going to make really slow progress because if you're working just on the oral skills to work out where the pitch is all of the time, there's no space and time for anything else, really. Um, so I think that, that kind of pretty much covers the justification for finger tapes is that, that visual trains the oral skills. And yeah, some, some children would never need a finger tape. They would just naturally know what's in tune and what's not. But we're not looking for, you know, Suzuki philosophy. We're not looking for the children who are naturally able to play in tune. We're looking for ways to help every child.
be able to play in tune, regardless of what route they need to take on the way there. <coughs> Very good. Excellent. Okay, so to go back to shifting, uh, we are now able, our students for, um, are now able to move between first position and third position in a very slow and controlled way that is not going to be useful for any pieces really, right? So then in terms of taking the next step towards them being able to play pieces, then we need to introduce the playing in different positions. So I would say that most children, um, well, I really hope that by book two they can play a G major twinkle variation, starting on D3 in first position. So the next stage that I would recommend you use is to practice it in first position first so that they hear the G major um, sound. And then and then you do a ghosty up to up to third position on the D string. So let's do this. I'm doing the thing I always tell all of you not to do, and I'm telling you what to do rather than doing it. Let's just do it. I will give you time to write it down after. So, Kit, what's your favourite twinkle variation? Busy, busy, stop, stop. Busy, busy, stop, stop. Okay, we will play busy, busy, stop, stop in G major, starting on D3. And if you're teaching somewhere like this where you have students that are not your own, you may realise, oh, some kids really don't know how to do that. And then you might have to take a pause and be like, right, I want you to practice that this week. And next week we'll do it again. And then you do the next step next week. But, I mean, if the teachers haven't taught G major twinkle by the end of book one. I don't really know how they did their minuets. So hopefully that wouldn't happen, but you know, strange things happen. <laughs> okay, so ready and. <laughs> Can 
can try that. You can say, what are the things we're going to check now? Give me something to check. Um, what, do you what would you check that the students are doing correctly? What, during that scale? No, now, like, oh. if, if, if they're, like, in third position. Check that it's in tune? Yep, so that's good. Another thing? Oh, I don't know. So okay, but uh, check that they've got their thumb opposite. Good, check they brought their pet with them to the beach or whatever. Kit, another thing to check? Uh, elbow position. Excellent, another thing? I check the bow position. Just make sure it's close to the bridge because, well, they can't make a good sound otherwise. Yeah, but if they're playing here, they don't need to move closer yeah. to the bridge for third position, do they? I mean, I, I, you're obviously not incorrect, but I think that would be quite confusing for the first time they've ever done yeah. shifting to suddenly think about the bow. Okay. And I'm hoping that most of them would be attached sure enough to have a good yeah. sound. That Make they sure might. the fingers are firmly down. Yes, that they, that they were, yeah, that they're making, and that they're... It's harder to put your fingers down in third position. Yeah, and especially lots of those little violins have not very well set up bridges, so, yeah. and they've got very skinny strings. Good, something else to check? Uh, good that their fingers aren't like doing this. And one more thing? Did you say elbow? Someone said elbow, yes. Waterfall. Waterfall, excellent, well done. So you'll see a lot of this, you'll see a lot of that, you'll see a lot of this. And you'll see also a lot of this, but you know, obviously that's like a sort of side issue. Um, good. Okay. So then we'll then you will do twinkle, and the thing that will happen is that they can't work out this part. They get very confused by that, and then they're all right, and then they get very confused by four. Um, one of the ways I've, I've heard that can help with four is if you put the first finger down and pluck the string with your fourth finger. Really Good. Down as well as the fourth finger being, so that they don't extend it. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So all of these little games you can do, or you can just do my turn, your turn. Uh, sorry. Or just start it and then get them to join in when they worked out what it is, and then. And then they can pretty much, and you know, like all of you will have good enough teaching skills to work out. You're going too fast. What can you put in between? If they don't understand how Twinkle is working in third position, go back to first position and talk about, okay, we've got a big jump up, then we've got a step up, then we've got a step down, a step down, a step down, a step down, a step down again. Right, if we're doing a scale, what is that? It's a set of steps. So when you, if you do the scale in third position, all you have to remember is this, to play red, because then, break it down and it just depends how focused they are, how into the violin they are, how much they want to, you know, like all of those kind of things. So it's just like there's a huge variation in how quickly you can go, what they've done with their private teachers, how well you're explaining it, uh, you know, whether it's the end of term and they're knackered or whether they've just had a half term break and they're super excited to be back and see their friends, blah, 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 blah. Yeah? Okay, so then, uh, Long, long ago is a very good one to practice in third position. Let's play G major third position. And if you have, you know, again, thinking about the multi-level um, groups, for example, if you're on a workshop or a play together and you have some kids who are great at shifting and you have other kids who are not, if everybody's in book two, you can say, okay, we're gonna play long, long ago theme from book two. If you are happy with shifting, you can do it in third position. If you're not happy with shifting, just play the book two version. And then if you've been doing it in third position, come back for first position for the variation. Yeah? So, so let's practice that. Some people decide to just do G major, normal, twinkle, or you can all just, it doesn't matter anyway. Um, but when you get to the end of the theme, we're going to come back and just play the variation normal in first position.
difficult than that because um, I do. That's exactly what I was going to say. For my personal, uh, at this stage, if they play G2 in third position or they play open string, it doesn't matter. They're not going to need to play like over all the strings. We're talking about this part. So either they can do this if they or it's totally fine. As long as they don't shift in the middle of the piece, that's completely fine with me. Um, good. And so if you if you have a group that are doing that or a student that's doing that in the private lesson and it's not in tune, what would be a good idea to do for? I'll just go back to tuning the G with the open string. Good, just excellent. Checking in that they've kind of got the right framework for where to start. Good, and then? Uh, you check the keynote. The open string. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. So if we're clear, this is right. <laughs> Yes. Uh, in colours? Do you remember which colour it is? Oh, yellow. Yellow with a hot pink three. Excellent. And obviously you would talk about tones and semitones as well. Good. Okay. So uh, and then you can go back to the scale if you need to. It depends, you know, how long every, all of these steps are having between them, how much you need to review and how much you can just move through them. Um, good. So then, like, basically, once they've <coughs> understood the position, they can do loads of book one early pieces in third position. The thing that they need to know, which, and for my private students when we start doing this, I'll just give them the parent a list, is what number of the scale the piece starts on. So let's say, yeah, Go Talent Ready is a great piece to do in third position. What do you need to tell the parent so that they can play it in the useful key? that it starts on the third, and literally like third finger on the D string. Yeah? Because you're going to keep everything in G major so that they have the sound, again talking about the intonation, they have the sound feedback that it's got the ringing notes, they're staying in the same position for in the yellow finger pattern, so that they're playing in G major. So, I mean, there's no reason why you can't do it clearer. But you definitely don't want to, like, if they, you know, I've never had this, but I can imagine it might be possible to have someone. And then that's just all sorts of wrong because you're teaching a different finger pattern, it's a different key. Like, the, what they need to know is that it starts on the third finger. Yeah. What about Lightly Rogue? How about that? Uh, what was it? Yeah, I'm holding. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Can you play us the beginning like anywhere? So you need to tell them the tell them the first note. You can do it, Caroline. What key is it in the first book? In book one. Shh. What key is 
slightly away, the proper one in. A major. A major. Yeah. And it starts on E. E. So if you're transposing into G major, what will it start on? D. So then you just say to them, you start on one on the A string in third position. So you need to give the finger number, the string, and the position to the parent so that they cannot get it wrong. Yeah? yeah. Good. Um, Mimi, what about if we're going to try, which I wouldn't recommend, but just for the purposes of this exercise, oh, come little children. Come little children. A G. Yeah. Excellent. A1 in third position. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Good. Uh, okay, does everyone understand you, what so we're doing? Can you teach um, um, Song of Wind in A major in third position? Does that work? If you start with number two on the. I'm just thinking that. Yeah, I don't tend to I don't tend to teach the faster ones in third position, I have to say. Okay. No, I guess it's just quite neat to have it on two strings, isn't it? I feel like that's the kind of point. Yeah. Because if you did that, it would go to the E as well. And then they can just focus yeah, on I mean, I, yeah, the, the songs that I... Probably going on going on E. Yeah, the songs that I tend to do a lot of are Go to Aunt Rody, Lightly Row, May Song, yeah. um, Twinkles, Long Long Ago. I think that's it, pretty much. Is it, what, what's the problem with them being on the E string then? There isn't one, it's just the G is so resonant, I think it's easier for them to be able to hear that it's in the right key. They've okay. been really deep in, D, in G major for the end of book one and for quite a lot of book two. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if you teach a lot of shifting on the A and the E, you run the risk of the elbow becoming very mobile this way, but not this way. Mm. So if you're just... Um, making sure that you've got all bases covered. So you make sure they're in those as well, right? To make sure they're mm -hmm. aware of that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I mean about the G is so resonant that the one and the third position on D string is going to it's going to be e that's the easiest note for them to pitch without thinking about it very carefully. Um, good. Okay, so during this stage. Have a seat if you'd like to. During this stage of practicing these pieces in third position, I am also teaching and checking in the lessons that they're doing like five or ten ghosties on each string, each practice. And a very good um, way to kind of combat, oh my god, I can't do ten on each string every practice, that's 40, is like, right, get out your... Uh, you know, get out your stopwatch, how long do you think it takes? And the parents say about five minutes, and the, t and the children say about 20 minutes. And then obviously, it's about like one minute's practice to do 10 on each string, because they take about a second and a half each. So it's really nice for them to see, oh my God, it's not even two minutes. Great. And then you're like, you can do that. <laughs> As I do the same thing with, uh, to go on a slight tangent, with reviews, like how many reviews are you practicing each day when you're on like maybe minuet or perpetual motion for example? Oh, we're doing three? Well, do you think that you could do five or six? Mm, quite a lot. Okay, well let's see how long it takes to play a twinkle, lightly row, song of the wind, go to that roadie and no little children. Joe, what do you think? Five minutes. Exactly, and then the, the same thing will happen. The children will say, half an hour, and the parents will say, 10 or 15 minutes, so you get your stopwatch out. And most of the early book one pieces you can do in less than a minute. So you can do five and five, and we do, we do that in the lesson sometimes. Like, right, let's see if we can get five minutes in five, five pieces in five minutes. Oh. Will you still be getting them to play all the twinkles at this point, or just one a day, one different one a day? I, I try and do two twinkles plus, Three? depends. 
I mean, if you think about the skills that you've got in Twinkle Theme, it's reproduced in a lot of the long bow pieces. Whereas the quick changes between like go time, uh, sorry, stop pony, stop pony, like those quick changes and fatter than caterpillar are not reproduced in any other pieces in book one really. Maybe Gosse Kabob, depending on how fast you play it. So I think that the variations, like two variations, and then Twinkle Theme becomes one of the review pieces that they may or may not practice. Um, and just to finish this tangent, I think it's really useful to have. Uh, to recommend that they make their own uh, um, lucky dip cards, have two envelopes or two pots and work their way through them so that they're not just playing their favourite pieces each time. Um, and you know, point out to them that even when you're at the end of book three, if you're playing seven or eight pieces, sorry, the end of book one, if you're playing seven or eight pieces, you will play them every other day. Because there are 17 pieces in the book. Did you say make two lucky dip pots? Yeah, because you have one that you've done and then you oh, okay. so, yeah. one that you haven't done yeah. so that yeah. you don't just because otherwise you can oh, you know just by the laws yeah. of, of random mm -hmm. picking you can not get one for quite a long time mm -hmm. okay. yeah. and the kids get to know which crease means it's allegretto which you know <laughs> spot means that it's allegro or whatever that's very clever okay good so during this time what are they doing in their practice kit for shifting? Uh, they go through exercise. Excellent. And Bex? Uh, they're going to be doing a G major scale. Very uh, good. Position. Very good. And maybe one more thing? Um, a G major twinkle. Yeah, a G major twinkle or another piece, mm -hmm. like an easy piece for them to do in third position. Good. Uh, and so then at this point, I would introduce harmonics if you haven't already. And for my teaching I talk about a harmonic being an extension in third position so they would do like a ghosting and then we just say if you if you stretch your four and you flatten it you want a flat finger for a harmonic you'll get there so your hand is in third position but your fourth finger has put the extra tone on top and then you come back to okay and then we can do the harmonic at the end of uh Music. Which is often the first shift that they do in a piece. I would recommend you do that as the first shift they do in a piece. And we can do harmonic allegro, which is super fun. Let's play it. I know I've talked to you before, but just review. So the first stage of harmonic allegro is finding the allegro, finding the top A harmonic at the beginning of each line and everything else is in first <coughs> position. So what we're going to do is slow down the retake to find it again. Okay, so it's not going to be in time, but each line is in time. So it will go like this. recommend that you give your students a spot for the harmonic at this stage so that they can see where they're aiming for for all the same reasons as we talked about before okay so from the beginning let's just play and watch me for your retakes they're going to be slower than you expect um ready play <laughs> Time, we do what's called advanced harmonic allegro, 
which goes much slower to start off with. And instead of A3, we are going to use the D harmonic. So we're going to start by finding these two notes. Just join in. Good. Okay, so this one, E3, becomes this note. So you're going to leave lots of time there for them to find that. And then we play. And obviously this means they've got to shift down much more quickly. Yeah, because they don't have an open string where that shift is. Okay, so we'll try to make sure you have a gap after your, before your second harmonic. Ready? And. Okay, let's make 
Make sure your fourth fingers um, on your A harmonic, please. Hold the string. Ready? Play.
So your first shift within a piece, rather than as an exercise, will probably be the harmonic the second time you get to the end of musette. Don't do it both times. And they will find that much easier if you've done the version of harmonic allegro with the D harmonics as well, because one of the things that's tricky about it is going to the D string, because they're so used to doing it on the A string, and it's it's also shifting during the harmonic, sorry, during the open string. Shift now, rather than... So it's those two things of getting the shift during the open string and making sure that they manage to get the finger and the bow onto the D string and with a root. <laughs> uh, level two, who can tell me who, what the first piece is you're going to teach a shift within the piece? A natural shift. A natural shift. shift. Playing in third position. Uh, who knows? Nope. I should clarify, assuming oh, you're doing what's in the book. Lily, Lily, the book. I personally teach the extension on Lily Gavot. It's an option. It is an option. I think I think what I'm thinking of is the first time it is on the top as a recommendation rather than on the top. Let me just see what I thought that was too much actually, it's actually uh, Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but I mean you could do as I said the long long ago in G. I mean, that, that's just, but having to teach it first time round is what she's loving. Oh, you know what? The Lonely Garot doesn't even have the third position as an option. Obviously, you can do it, but it's not printed in the book. That's a change. <laughs> is it? Well, I've got my books here. <laughs> well, you have a look and tell me if it is. No, it doesn't. I didn't think it did. You've got the harmonics in the in the ocarina, but that's not really talking about it. Um. Good, you've got harmonics in Boccherini, that's not what I'm talking about, but that is a very good point to make, thank you. So if you don't teach your harmonic at the end of the musette, that is the first time that it is recommended. Sorry, level one, so this is not really your area yet. Okay. It's actually not written though. It's not. Well, it's not printed, not. the harmonics in Bokhari. No, actually, it's not, is it? No, that's right. I, I, that was something else. So, who can tell me where it is printed if you need to look at your book? Go for it. Um, <laughs> I think Joe's right. I think it's in here. It's not, no, sir. Um, I just checked. Um, <laughs> is it Martini? No. No. Is it Minuet? Oh, no. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The minor minuet. Yeah. Yes. That, that really did. Do you mean in third position? 
Just blue finger pattern is one and two. Oh, big best friends, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah. So just, yeah, do a minor. Sorry? Two, two. No, I can't I'm, hear you. No. I haven't heard so, what you've said. Uh, do it before etude. Shifting in third position in blue finger pattern. No, I thought no. you said blue finger pattern, sorry. Oh, right. Yes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Oh, we're going to teach. I've got two students. No. Not really. No. I mean, it's pretty depressing. advanced, isn't it? <laughs> well, no, it's not depressing. It's just not got very many ringing notes, and it doesn't really. It's not a. It's not a key that they are used to. Yeah. They haven't. You know, it's not even natural minor, is it? No. No. So I think if you were going to teach red finger pattern, you just really wouldn't do this. Okay, so does anyone have another idea? Especially level twos that we were doing earlier in the other room. Oh, just do the marching. Finger. Yeah, finger marches, exactly. Yeah. So here we are, we're going to play. And you can either do... to an actual proper like heavy finger in another position yet okay so uh, staying in the G major finger pattern red finger pattern in third position one of the things that you can do is um, like long 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 ago in first position Someone else, if they want to practice that, and they can do 
the shifts wherever they want. It doesn't have to be at the end of the phrase. But long, long ago is really useful because the phrase ends are in good places to shift between the positions. Yeah? So you could do long, 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 sorry, go turn up road. At a certain point, they will realise that they can't always do a ghosty, or if they don't realise, you will have to tell them. Because the ghosty is getting ready for a guide note shift, right? And if you're going from an open string, you can't do a guide note shift unless you put a finger down in first position, which is not what you would do, right? So, for example, let's do long, long ago, but one, if you were going to do that. If we're doing what we were doing before. And therefore, it's a jumping shift from an open string. And that one's up. Okay, so one of your key rules is you always shift on the lower finger because you don't want to give your audience the pitch of a higher note from the one they're going to. So if you were playing, it, does, it, it doesn't make sense. So motion in B flat. So um, so they're going to be very good at your at the yellow with the hot pink finger pattern. But then um, for example if you say okay we're going to do the first position uh, perpetual motion but only on the A string Ready? Play! Okay, then we keep going really slow. 
slowly. Ready? Go.
two shifts as written, you need to make sure their finger pattern is okay. You need to make sure that they're all right with going like this. I can't do this today. It's pretty simple, yeah. right? In terms of the actual shifting, it's quite difficult to put together in what's needed in the piece with the grace note and all of that. But in terms of the actual shifting skills, it's not bad. Right, then we have the button G minor, which I would recommend you just do exactly as written in first position. Um, is there a place I do a shift? No. Uh, and then we have humoresque. So humoresque is the first place where you're doing more shifting. Uh, shall we just play humoresque? Yeah, let's just play humoresque. <laughs> humoresque. We're just going to play the whole thing. And I'm going to talk about where I do what. The guide note is the G on the one. So you play one, yeah. and then oh, the one what? goes onto the G, oh, and you put the two on. Oh, yeah. And it saves you from that open D, which is not too bad, but it's not beautiful. And if they... did the teaching points for humoresque. If you teach this part in first, you get a lovely opportunity to practice the EM4. Go up there. So that's a jumping shift, they've done that before. In uh, book one pieces. I'm hoping they will have by now. We're going to do the portamento shift, which will for ages sound like this. And that's okay with me. And as in review, it will become an actual portamento shift rather than a sort of audible guide note. Well, it's not really a guide note because it's a portamento shift, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got another jumping shift in 15. Oh, okay. 
Why? Because I want them to keep getting it better in tune in the double string crossing with the left elbow movement for the four and the three. Mm -hmm. Why is there to make sure that's moving freely? Mm -hmm. And the one, I mean, there's so much. If you play this, you've got B natural to F natural, so low one. Double string crossing with the stretch for the four and the three being on the G sharp. Back to the low one, double string crossing the other way. And back to B natural on the, in the middle string. Whereas, obviously there's nothing interesting with the string crossing. And also it's the fingers in, what colour is it? Uh, gray finger pattern, yeah. which they've never even done in first position yet. So I just find it's too much for doing it in third position as well. But mostly I do the other one because I think that gives great benefits rather than because this has great drawbacks. Okay, yeah. Do you ever find that they don't get that four finger in tune, the A? Oh yeah, of course, all the time. That's why I want them to practice it millions of times because it's really hard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, and then we have the big shifting section in the middle, which is a jumping shift every time, isn't it? <laughs> so you can kind of release the two. They've done lots of shifting from two to two, or one finger to one finger, and they have not done lots of shifting back quickly. You could teach. all the way until the end of bar 33 and then here they have to do that finger pattern you've just avoided so you get both practiced if you do my way <laughs> oh actually yeah, yeah 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 and the, the point is to make sure that four is linking this yeah, I mean, I think it was too quick for them to hear whether it's ringing or not, but make sure it's in tune. Yeah, yeah so yeah. use your finger patterns. Good, and this is often the first place that you will put vibrato into here on a finger that's not a three. In review, not the first time they play it. They won't have vibrato yet, probably. Would you would you do fib on that first long E at the end of bar four? Yeah, if they can. Well if you do when you're if you're putting vibrato back in in review, yes. Okay. You would do yeah, sorry, I'm talking nonsense, it's not the first one. Um and also actually Lily Gavot offer people to Basically, you want a, a note that's going to last much longer than it will without pause. It's the pause notes that people are going to put the vibrato onto. Yeah, yeah, no. I've it up psychologically. I'll just lock up. Okay. <laughs> it sounds so flowing when you don't big on it, but my bit just goes, no! Mm -mm. Oh. <laughs> do, you, do you use um, the bar strategy um, one mic shifts? Because that's sometimes quite. Uh, 
I do teach it. I think it's really important not to ignore the lullabies, and they're really useful if you put them in between sites concerto. So I normally teach sites one. They're so excited to get going on sites one, and then sometimes sites two, and then a lullaby, or sites one lullaby, sites two lullaby, um, and then other pieces in between the Vivaldi's. And I would normally put perpetual motion between the two Vivaldi's, not in the order that it's in in the piece or in the book. Yeah, so book four, I think, is really not helpfully organised. So I would normally teach sites one, then sometimes sites two or a lullaby, sites three, and then another lullaby. Vivaldi one, perpetual motion. Vivaldi three, half yeah. double. And they often have done other pieces in between as well. And for the lullabies, would you live on each note? Is that the whole point? Yeah, hopefully by then they've got all the vibrato that's happening all the time. And I don't do this, I don't do the finger that's in the book, but that is level three. Um, so um, the end of humor I would put a four on the second note in the last bar. Mm -hmm. Because then you can get that lovely thing, whereas this I mean it's just sort of doesn't have the expression. So this is the big shifting piece and during Gavotte in G minor you want them to practice just going from like just finding that note. Yeah. Um, and some of them will they'll probably still have a one take a three take which obviously is a one take in third position, it's probably a good idea for some of them to do one, two, one, two. And others, they'll just be able to go straight to the two. Okay, and then I don't do any, sorry, Mimi, have you, you want more time? No. I don't do any shifting in Battle Gavot at all. You can do 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 four three one two in thirty nine, but frankly, I think there's so much going on in that box already. I don't really want to add it. Oh no, I tell a lie. I do do the third position in uh, sixteen and seventeen. That is the only shift they do in this piece. So it's also quite nice for them, they've got Humoresque which has got loads of shifting, then they've got Becca which has just got one. I've often thought about um, st st starting it in third position and just staying up hmm. on the first line because you're saying... Can't 
avoid. Mm. But if you're adding something in that's really hard for them, they're going to be 17 and a half before they get into book four. Mm. And if you're, if they're really good at shifting, there's kind of no need. Mm. So I think that's why I often don't end up doing all of those kind of the extra ones that you can do. Um, so in the Barker Ops, I'm shifting in the second full bar of Gavot 2, and that's the only place. continuing to do shifting exercises in group, using easy pieces, learning different pieces that have got shifting in them. Tonalisation I use massively, really, really often. Like every group lesson we always start with tonalisation for my book four and fives. And we'll often play, we'll do a few different versions now. Just tell me when you're ready to finish scribbling. in G minor. Um, I did that last time. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Not much in it. Yes. Yeah. Good. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So let's just finish off by talking about tonalisation. Bex and Freya, you know how tonalisation goes. Don't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's all play just a few different versions. So tonalisation during book two, we would be doing this as one of the things they're doing in third position. I should have said that when we were talking about it. Mm -hmm. So let's just do third position tonalisation. We'll just play the minor because I don't want to spend loads of time on it. And that's often the first time they've done second position. There's no second position in book three. Uh, there is quite a lot in book four. So you want to make sure that you're doing like long, all of those easy pieces and tonalisation in second position. Um, and then in terms of actually practising shifting, one of the things we do a lot of is playing tonalisation all on the three. So we'll go ahead and... Yeah. 
is that we do what's called loopy bows for tonalization, which you have to introduce in first position because otherwise it's too much all at once, which is instead of a minimum on each note, we are going to play courtship, sorry, minimum, and then slur. It's basically viotti bowing. So let's just try that. So the first note gets repeated, but then everything else, you change your note in the middle of the bow, and you change your bow on the same note. Uh, level ones.